Hello and welcome to another episode of Rika's Rants. I'm your host, Rika DiGiorgio. So, I'm going to take a quick little break from all the Peter Pan rants I've been doing recently. Um, and it's time for story time. Story time with Rika! Woo! And the reason why I'm doing it is because I was talking to my dad um, about this the other night. And we were just talking about... Because my dad doesn't have the greatest of memories sometimes. Um, I usually have to remind him of interesting stories that have happened when I was a little kid. So, we were talking about how when I was in fifth grade, I had this really, really, really not nice teacher. And how it was really difficult. And because everyone can relate to this, because everyone has that story with that teacher they just don't like. Um, the amazing thing is, is that this teacher in particular, like, I can... Every teacher I've ever had after her, I compared to this teacher. And I'm not going to actually name the teacher, but I have to name her something. So let's call her Mrs. Mrs. Vazzini. Because I'm giving her an Italian last name because she was an Italian uh, American. And part of the reason why that's important is because my dad and I are also Italian. And my dad put me in her class because he thought there would be some, like, Italian camaraderie, you know, some Italian friendliness. Like, hey, Paisan, that kind of shit. So, let me back it up a little bit. I'm about 10 years old. And I'm living in Oakland, and my dad had just got a new girlfriend that I introduced them to because I knew her and I knew her daughter. And I went to school with her daughter, and her daughter was not exactly nice to me in school. Um, she and her friends were kind of bullies to me. And then I got my own weird little random revenge when I, like, introduced them, and all of a sudden my dad and her mom are dating that was sort of my own little weird revenge that now she had to go and tell her friends that I was basically essentially her stepbrother. So all of a sudden we're, my dad and I move with his girlfriend, with her daughter, uh, to Alameda, which if you don't know where Alameda is, Alameda is like, like a 10 minute drive from Oakland. And it's sort of, I mean, Oakland is part of Alameda County, so it's it's the city the county is named after, and it's an island separated from a bridge. It's sort of its own. It's I mean Alameda is a nice quiet area. Um, it's there's a giant Asian population. Um, what I notice it's very. Um, there's a lot of seagulls always flying by. There is a, it's just a beach. It's an island. So. Um, I, that's the most anyone's ever talked about Alameda uh, in a, quite a while. Um, but it's a nice little town. It's a little island thing, blah, blah, blah. And, but it was a big culture shock for me because the house I currently live at was the house I grew up at. So luckily my dad still owned the house. We moved back after that relationship didn't last. Um, but then, so I'm put in school and the my dad goes to enroll me at I don't even know if I should name the school. Like, I'm afraid of... You know what? Fuck it. I enrolled at Frank Otis Elementary. And if you do your research, you'll know who I'm talking about. But I'm just going to say the name I gave her, Mrs. Vizzini. My dad sees her. My dad was wearing a shirt that had... he. My dad owned a couple Italian restaurants um, when I was little and before I was little. One of them was called Tibaccio. Ristorante, which just said, which means I kiss you in Italian. It was the I kiss you at uh, a restaurant. And it had a logo of a man and woman kissing, sort of a drawing, simple drawing of just them embracing. So my dad's wearing that shirt because my mother, who owned the restaurant with him, licensed um, the logo, like made it like a, made it a big thing. My dad had a watch with the logo on it. We had magnets in the house. We had shirts. We had hoodies. Um, it was kind of 
like the family crest in a weird way. So my dad's wearing that to enroll me in school, and he sees in this Mrs. Vizzini sees the shirt, sees my father, sees the shirt, and kind of reads it and smiles. And my dad notices that and says, "Oh, who's that?" She's like, "Oh, she teaches fifth grade." But I was like, "Great, can we put it? Can we have Rico go to her class?" So they, I, all of a sudden, I'm in this class. My dad even made a whole big deal, like, before school started, like, hey, you know, I got you a teacher. She's going to be Italian. Great. Now, at the time, I was getting obsessed with Frank Sinatra. Um, I had been into Sinatra for a couple of years. My dad introduced him to me, and I talk all about this in uh, the Happy Birthday Frank Sinatra video rant that I do. Uh, it's a black and white video. If you're curious about me singing, I do that at the end of the video. So, she, most Italians love Sinatra. She was no exception. So, we bonded a little bit about being Italian and being into Sinatra. First day of fifth grade, first day of class, she had me get up and sing uh, I've Got the World on a String for the class. And I didn't mind it. I was having fun. And, and in some ways, it set me apart from the kids. In some other ways, it, it made me interesting to the other students um the other hand it also kind of ostracized me i didn't really have any friends when i was in i didn't really have that many friends until i met michael um who wasn't even at my school we met through our our mothers so going through the school year and then i quickly realized that mrs vizzini was not a nice person and was very very stern was very strict and could not, like, as it turns out, the fact that we shared an ethnicity and a love of Sinatra didn't matter. And at the time, my father's influence sort of intrigued me. So I was sort, a lot of my dad's words were coming out of my mouth. And my dad very much raised me with always question authority. Just because, you know, he said, respect is earned, not aged. And I still believe that. Um, so I'm also going, I'm 10 years old, or I'm 11 years old, and I'm going through puberty at the same time. And I'm being raised at home to challenge authority. And I'm going up against this teacher who everyone feared. Everyone did not like her. I don't know of anyone who actually genuinely enjoyed being in her class. And to prove that, because Facebook is a, amazing thing in some some cases uh i was in contact with a bunch of the students that i shared in fifth grade all these fellow students that i knew um and we all got to talking about mrs vizzini about how um how we all never really recovered from her and how she was just she terrified us and she was very strict and she was very controlling and very mean-spirited and like i said i'm no it's not like my teacher not like my fifth grade teacher was any worse than yours so you can all relate to this there was a couple times where i finally got in her bad graces um we were all required at the beginning of the school day to wait for her in a circle outside the classroom and we were all given a number, and we all stood in our numbers in this giant circle outside. And I'm pretty sure I was number three. So I'm staying at three, someone's next to me, four, it's a giant circle, and it goes up to whatever, 20 students or whatever, 25 students. And we'd have to wait for her every morning, what, even, if it was, even if it was raining, and in Alameda it rains a lot. It was always kind of foggy and always misty and always cold. So we're all just shivering at 8 in the morning, just like waiting for our teacher to show up. Sometimes she was late. Sometimes she was on time. So then she she would come in. She would go up to the door, and we'd all line up in our respective numbers in a line, walk up to the classroom. And this was the really, this is when I knew I was not going to get along with her. We were required to look her in the eye, shake her hand, and say, Good morning, Mrs. Vizzini. 
at the end of class, at the end of the day, we'd all line up again, shake her hand, and look her in the eye again and say, Goodbye, Mrs. Bazzini. Have a nice weekend or have a nice day or have a nice night, whatever. And one the one time, this was the first time she sort of got my face. Um, I'm, the camera's tilting just a little bit. Um, because it's 8 in the morning and I was half asleep, I just kind of looking down, just like, and I said, Good morning, Mrs. Vizzini. How are you? And she said, Mr. DiGiorgio. I said, and now all of a sudden I'm like wide-eyed, like what? And she's like, you look at me. You treat me with respect. You look me in the eye when you shake my hand. And that was the polar opposite of what my dad had instilled, which was respect is earned, not aged. And yelling at a kid because he's half asleep, it's 8 in the morning, he's cold, and he's looking down, kind of shivering, and then getting offended by that did not help uh, the case for me thinking that she deserved my respect. Let me just tilt it back a little bit. So that was my, and I and I kind of stammered, I'm like, I'm sorry, and I kind of just looked her in the eye again, I'm like, I'm sorry, Mrs. Ciccoli, have a nice morning, I thank you, blah, blah, blah. And then we were required to do the Pledge of Allegiance and sing the National Anthem. Now, I know there are, a lot of students had to sing the National had to do the Pledge of Allegiance. I didn't like the fact that I was required to do it. I feel like the Pledge of Allegiance and singing the National Anthem should be um, something that you choose to do or choose not to do. That is the role as an American or even as just a citizen that if you're forced to do something, then you automatically are instilled that you have no free speech or you have no free will. And I didn't like the fact that I was being told I had to do this. So when it was time to do the Pledge of Allegiance, I would stand up like everyone else because I just I didn't want to cause trouble. But I didn't want to also bend to her world, her wishes. So I stand there. Everyone else is doing Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm just standing there. Then we were, just, we were told we had to sing uh, the National Anthem. And despite the fact that I would love to sing, and I was actually a good singer uh, when I was a kid, I didn't want to sing it. I always felt like it was an overrated, outdated song. It makes... It's 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 not timeless. The song itself is fine when they needed a national anthem, but now it's just I don't. I'm also not that type who is overly patriotic. I'm not proud to be an American. I'm grateful I was born American, but especially now, no, I'm not proud to be an American. I'm embarrassed to be an American. Um, I have some fans that are not American, and I've talked to them one uh, in particular about what it's like to be an American nowadays. And they all say, like, I don't understand how you guys can stand your president and your current government. And we're like, we don't. So I had those feelings way back when because um, Bush was was president. So it was sort of the same feeling. And my dad was very heavily into politics and very liberal and very democratic. And I was very much instilled with the idea that our current situation back in 2001 was not great. So I was already kind of like, I don't want to sing the national anthem because I'm not happy about America right now. So she would catch me not singing and she would take me off to the side and she would say, Mr. New Georgia, why didn't you sing the national anthem? You were required to sing the national anthem. And I said, I don't want to sing the national anthem. And she said, why not? I'm, I, I, you have to. And I said, I don't have to. And then I could feel my father's voice coming out at me. And I was like, I don't have to. And she's like, Rico, if you don't sing the national anthem in, in my classroom, you're going to get in trouble. And I said, okay, give me, I'll, then I'm in trouble. At that point, I didn't care. There were more than a couple times where she just wanted me to bend to her will and I had no, I had no interest. Um, at the same time, I was getting really sick. 
This is I I have been battling the headaches and migraines um, since I was four, but whether it was a combination of puberty and anxiety and depression or psychosomatic or whatever, it was an actual diagnosis. Um, someone a doctor diagnosed it as cyclic vomiting syndrome or something. I, I don't know. I don't know what the fuck I have. I know I I am aware that stress um, is a contributing factor to it. I was very stressed about my current situation. I was stressed that I was all of a sudden moved to a place I didn't want to know or, or had no interest. I wanted to go back to my house in Oakland. Um, I wasn't particularly fond of the fact that I was living with one of my bullies from school, even though I had a slight, like, fuck you to her in my own way. So I started getting really sick. And I had an injury, I, you know, because my dad and his girlfriend were trying to get me to do some after school activities. They had me join soccer. And I had a really bad injury where I got kicked really hard behind my leg. And I had a bad limp. And I brought on migraines and, and I just wasn't feeling well. I was just a wreck. And so I was missing a lot of school. But I would try and go to school, and but I had this fucking limp for like two or three weeks. And Mrs. Vizzini, I, I'm, I'm, I know I might slip saying her actual name. Uh, Mrs. Vizzini, uh, one time in front of my dad, or I, there was another incident with my dad. She accused me of saying, she said, your limp keeps changing, Rico. She imply I was faking it. And I just looked at her and I said, no, it's not. How, how, and I was mortified that it was an adult accusing me of faking it. And I was like, it hurt. My leg hurt. And my head hurt. So I started missing a whole lot of school. Um, due to the headaches. And puberty did not help either. So I was this tiny little skinny little runt. And all of a sudden I just ballooned up and just like packed on like... 40, 50 pounds because I was immobile. I was bedridden. I was just laying in bed for days at a time and I, and I didn't know what was going on with me and my dad was worried and my dad was taking me to psychologists and, psychi and psychiatrists and they were prescribing me drugs that were knocking me out and perking me up. So I was just like a narcoleptic, insomniac mess. Um, going through puberty at the same time. So... For fifth grade, Mrs. Vizzini um, was hard to deal with. When I would actually get enough um, strength to go to school, it was impossible to deal with her because she would flat out accuse me of just trying to get out of schoolwork and trying to get out of school. When, And that's another reason why I never respected her is because, you know, she's... She's supposed to shape our minds and get us ready for the next generation. She, we are the next generation. She's trying to, you know, she's trying to instill education and and a form of unity with us, and it backfired tremendously because she is a complete terrifying bitch. So there was a, there was a, I, I kept going home when I would go to school and I would tell my dad, I'm like, this is this teacher is just. I can't deal with her, man. She and my dad said, "Ah, oh, you just got to deal with it." Blah blah blah. And honestly, one of my my only solace was listening to Frank Sinatra and and watching old movies, and that was my only way of getting through it. Was I had my own thing that was for me. And but the problem with that was that I brought my passion into this into school. So there were times where I my teacher. This teacher, Mrs. Vizzini, called my dad in one time to the office to talk to him about my obsession with Sinatra and how it is impacting and affecting my schoolwork where it wasn't me not doing my work, but it was like I would, like if I had to write, a, if I had to do a, a project where I had to make my own world, I named it Sinatratopia or something, I, I believe it. <laughs> I don't remember it. And it got to the point where it was like I wasn't interested in anything else because it was all I really had to sort of... I didn't have any friends. I didn't have a girlfriend. I was miserable and sick. And the only thing that helped me feel good was, you know, doobie doobie doo. And it wasn't this bitch. She wasn't helping. So one time, 
there was a there was a school field trip to a pool, the swimming pools, and even though I felt terrible, my dad said, "Rico, you really should go. You like to swim. All your all your students are going to be there. You really should go to a field trip and try and relax and you know hang out with your hang out with the students." And my dad was going to chaperone. He's going to be one of those parents of chaperones. And, or he was going to be there just in case I couldn't make it through the day. And he even told Mrs. Vizzini, he said, like, I'm going to be there just in case. She said, okay. And I tried swimming for like 20, 30 minutes, and I just felt really nauseous. And I couldn't get it. And I just, you know, it was all this kids screaming and splashing and lots of loud noises and... When you are when I would when I get sick, I can't really do a lot of strenuous activity because I get nauseous and dizzy very very easily. So I told my dad, I said, I, I want to go home. I can't do it. I'm gonna throw up. So my dad grabbed me and we started walking the parking lot. And Mrs. Vizzini is in her car or something, and she's like huddled up. And my dad sort of called over, he's like, Hey, I'm gonna take him home, and I start throwing up. I the nausea just took over. I start throwing up as we're walking and I'm trying to get my shit together. And she fucking said, quite a little actor he is, huh? Not only is she implying that I'm faking it, as I'm projectile vomiting, she's saying it to my dad to try and say, like, your son's a little actor, your son's a lying little fuck. And my dad looked at me and he looked at her in quite amazement and I remember him like in the car. He's like, I can't fucking believe she said that. And and he finally understood what I was saying this whole time. I'm like, she is not nice. She's not even remotely friendly. So it got to the point where I was still getting really sick and I was missing a ton of school. And truant officers would come to my house to basically find out, like, why my dad is not letting me go to school. They wanted to arrest my dad. And my dad had to show them as I'm, like, huddled up in blankets with a bucket next to me throwing up. And they're like, does he look like he's ready to go to school? And there were a couple times where, like, the law kind of pushed him and said, you need to get your son to school. Or you need to, like, get him homeschooled. So... There were times where he said, Rico, I don't have a choice. You have to go to school today. And I go to school and I throw up. I go to the principal's office and the principal would call my dad and say, come get your son. Like, it was such a miserable time where, like, the teachers, the teachers and the principal all said, the principal, I remember this, the principal said, have your son throw up in my office and hung up on my dad. So my dad said, all right, Rico, go throw up in her office. And so I'd. This was like the routine for like a couple, like a, another month where I would like get up, argue with my dad. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't feel good enough to go to school. And I would go to school. He would drop me off. I'd spend an hour trying to suffer through it. Couldn't make it. Um, would throw up. Would go to the office, say, I'm sick and I'm throwing up. And, my, and then the principal would call up my dad and say, your son's too sick. Come pick him up. And my dad would be like, are you serious? Could he just stayed home and rested and felt better afterwards? And like, no, we needed to see him to make sure he was sick. Total fucking waste of my time and misery. So then, and I remind, this is the whole point is I remind my dad of the story. And I said, I'm sorry, the bed, I'm, my camera's on my bed, so I'm sorry to keep shaking. I'm animated. <laughs> so the whole point of this is that I told, I reminded my dad. That one of the truancy officers came over and was like trying to find out maybe there was another reason why I was skipping school. And she said, do you get along with your teacher? And I said, not at all. And she said, well, what is it like to go to school? And I said, and this is the quote. I said, going to school is like going to a dungeon and being greeted by a demon. And she wrote that down. I was like, really? Tell me about this teacher. And I just told everything that I've been telling her. I'm like... She's just not nice. She's very mean. She singles me out. But she also is very vicious to a lot of other kids. She's really she's really demanding. And isn't instilling any love or passion or education into learning or growing. It's all about do what I say. Listen to me. You respect me. I'm your teacher. So 
it got to the point where my dad and I basically decided, like, let's find another alternative. And we got a homeschooling teacher um, who was a fantastic teacher named Owen Maholland. And unfortunately, he passed um, uh, last year. And he was a tremendous man and very patient with me. And he would teach me when I would drop out of a grade because I was too sick. And then I'd try and go to the next grade, like sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, so on and so forth. Make it a couple months and then drop out. And then he would come and finish that year for me. So I basically, my my school education was basically going to school, then homeschool, then going to school, then homeschool, then going to school. And then eventually I dropped out and got my GED and then haven't looked back. Um, once I got my GED, Owen actually, like, we had a celebratory dinner. And Owen said that I was, like, his only graduate. So that was that was nice. Um, so this teacher was just the worst. Like I I I still never fully recovered from her. And I and my dad and I we talk about her and you know I found out that all the students that like had to deal with her in fifth grade would like go to the next school, which was Lincoln Middle School. And then Mrs. Vizzini either left or quit or got fired from Frank Otis and went on to Lincoln. So all these kids in fifth grade thinking, like, I'm free of her. I'm free of Mrs. Vizzini. Had to deal with her the next year. As like, oh, you thought you escaped? Nope. And as it turns out, um, I was right niceness respect is earned just because and i i i do respect teachers i do respect you know people in the education field because my father was a substitute teacher and my father was an actual teacher and i understood i always tried to be nice and not a teacher's bed but i always tried to get along and respect the teacher and get to know them this woman did not earn any respect and i honestly I don't know what she's doing. I'm always kind of curious how she is, but at the same time, she also was one of the worst adults I've ever dealt with. So tell me about your fucked up teacher. Do you have a messed up teacher that uh, scarred you for life? Or did you grow up fine, happy, and totally cool? I'm going to send this to some of the Facebook students. So uh, uh, I hope if you guys remember... Mrs. Vazzini, tell me what you remember. Tell me what you think. All right, guys. Hope all is well. Bye-bye.